live from the South Shields, it's your fortnightly video gaming podcast, Off the Rail, and your host for tonight, the Off Rail Gamer. I don't know about where you are, listener, but hasn't it got cold since the last time we met, eh? It has here. Forget winter is coming. It's here, in force. But I don't mind it. The only nuisance thing I don't like about this time of year is having to scrape the car off in the mornings. But that's not too much of a hassle, is it, really? Can you believe it's the last day in November? Our season of scare already seems like a faint memory, and can I just take a moment to address our neighbours in the north and wish everyone in Scotland a happy St Andrew's Day. Now, let me welcome you in out of the cold at long last to episode 16 of Off The Rails podcast, which you'll find on Spotify, Amazon Music and Google Podcasts. Of course, if you're listening to this, you already know which platforms you can find this show on, so that last sentence was somewhat redundant. Anyway, we're generating only good vibes here, so let's move on. You find yourself in the podcast introduction, in which I mention all my socials and where you can find me online. Well, here's the list. There's YouTube, where I try to upload a new video every Saturday morning. And I must stress, try, because I have missed the odd one here and there. Then there's X, where I tweet about new content that I've uploaded. Well, sometimes I do anyway. And almost lastly, there's TikTok and Twitch, which I'm still not using frequently just yet, but come the new year I'm hoping to stream semi-regularly on these platforms. Lastly, if you want to reach out to me with any comments, questions, feedback or ideas of content you'd like me to make in the future, you can send an email to offrailgamer at gmail.com and, as I'm the only person who monitors this account, you can rest assured it will be me reading it. I have one golden rule on the emails. Keep them clean and don't be mean. If you can do that, there's a good chance I just might read your message out in the next podcast. None of my online accounts are verified, but don't worry, if you look in the podcast episode description, you'll see I've included all my links. Isn't that nice of me? I reckon I should be on Santa's nice list this year, just for that alone. And if you're nice in your comments, I'm sure Santa will look favourably on you too. Now don't stand in the hallway, come on through to the Off The Rails Lounge where we can pick up the first segment of the show proper in which I tell you all about what I've been playing recently. Would you like some cocoa? Let's get the apologies out of the way first. I'm very sorry but there was no YouTube video at the weekend. I don't want to sound blasé about it. Believe me, I hate missing an upload, but I don't want to spend the next 20 minutes admonishing myself. Is that the word I'm looking for? Admonish. Warn or reprimand someone firmly. No, that doesn't quite seem to fit. Well, anyway, I don't think punitive measures will make for interesting listening, so let's move swiftly on. Two weeks ago nearly, we did have a YouTube video up on the channel with Sonic Gems on the PS2. We did a little fighting, and a little racing, and a little something else. It's not that I've forgotten what we got up to in that video. Honest? No, I'm just keeping a surprise for anyone who hasn't caught it yet, so there's some incentive to check it out. Yes. Yes, that's it. The video that didn't make it up on YouTube was Trubabrook. Set in 1967, you play as a professor who's won an all-inclusive stay in Drubebrook. But the town isn't quite the tourist hotspot that it used to be. And during your first night there, hijinks and shenanigans start kicking off. The game plays very similarly to Firewatch, by which I mean you walk around and click on in-world objects to interact with them. 
And you can also interact with the in-world NPCs in a similar way as you try to unravel the mysteries of the town. Like a loose thread, as you start pulling, the more you uncover. I'm being a little bit cryptic about it because I'm thinking of streaming this one when I do get myself all set up for it. I played a little more Star Trek Resurgence, but still haven't completed the main story yet. I did have to make a couple of tough decisions though, and I've been left second guessing my choices ever since. I think there's definitely replayability in this one, so yet again, maybe keep an eye out on my channels in the future. I'll get back to video games in just a moment, but on a slight tangent, I've also embarked on a Dungeons and Dragons campaign with some buddies on Discord. I don't know how much I can legally say about this, as I believe the plotline is the intellectual property of our Dungeon Master. What I can say is that I'm an absolute newbie to D&D, having only seen Critical Role, Yuxcast High Rollers and Ox Ventures online before. This is my first involvement in the game, and I am thoroughly enjoying it so far. Now, you may have seen that it was the Amazon Black Friday sales recently, and I found myself a pretty good deal on a machine that's able to run City Skylines 2. I have currently turned the visual settings down low, but I think I'm going to have to try cranking them up again just a little bit, because I don't currently have any pedestrians, which is making my city feel like a bit of a ghost town. I've been having a look at a fair number of games in the last week, one such being Medieval Dynasty on Game Pass. I'd seen a little of this previously and it looked interesting enough, but having spent some time with it now, I can tell you it's pretty addictive. It's got very similar vibes to Kingdom Come Deliverance, but it's less unforgiving and there's also less voice acting. Have a listen to this though, and I'll fill you in on how well it's been going for me so far. Right, so first up, I'm building my house, but I need more logs to complete construction. So I take my stone axe over to the nearest tree and start chopping away. The blinking thing only fell on me. Game over. So I start over, and this time I take greater care and step back while the tree's falling. Winter rolls around, and I've no warm clothes. Not only that, but I can't find a seamstress anywhere who can sell me warm clothes. So I freeze to death in my house. Game over. Start again. And this time, I'm buying those darn thermals. The seamstress lives in a village blooming miles away, but I make the pilgrimage and fork over the coin. There I am, heading for home, when I'm ambushed by three bandits. Outnumbered, I think I took one down with me, but the others saw me off. Game over! But in spite of these experiences, I'm still having terrific fun with this game, and I am determined to try and get good at it. If it sounds at all interesting to you, do yourself a favour and check out Medieval Dynasty for yourself, especially while it's on Game Pass, if you're curious to try it, but I haven't completely sold you on it just yet. I installed Mad Max on Steam and I've been getting a real kick out of it, but I feel I may have fluffed it up less than an hour in. I've been tasked with attacking a camp and must take out a sniper in a tower first. The only problem is... I've got no shotgun ammo, nor my harpoon that I've literally only just installed, so I have no way of getting the cheeky so-and-so. I think I may need to restart already, but at least I'm not losing much in the way of progress, I guess. I've returned to Klonoa Fantasy Reverie series and have restarted Door to Phantomville. I love the Klonoa games. I know they're kids' games, but growing up, I only had the demo for Lunatea's Veil, vale, which just included two levels. I still get a great sense of nostalgia when I play these games, though, and I have to say that sometimes I just want to chill out with something cutesy and brightly coloured that isn't going to challenge me too much. Don't get me wrong, though, Klonoa isn't just a walk in the park. It's definitely no Dark Souls, but it's good fun and a great little platformer. And talking of great platformers, I've also, and don't worry, this is the last game I have to talk about in this segment, I've also been playing some Crash Bandicoot Insane Trilogy. As a kid, I had Crash 2, 
but to my despair, I fear the disc has gotten a little scratched as the last time I played, the game throws up in the second warp room. In Insane Trilogy, I'm slowly working through the first game, and it just might test my sanity yet. Some levels are fine, but others really eat up your lives. I've beaten the first boss, Papu Papu, but am very slowly mastering the jumps a couple of levels on, which is giving me a really hard time right now. Anyway, that's what I've been playing recently, so now that we've covered all that, we can press on to the next segment. There's no listeners' whispers this week, but let's see if we can at least find some gaming news. The Steam autumn sale has just come to an end, which means my wallet can stop feeling quite so nervous about my spending habits now. As usual, there were some pretty good deals to be snatched up. Did you manage to grab yourself any bargains this year? Why not write in and let me know? Or, if there are any games that you'd just like to shout out. Don't worry if you missed out this time around though. The Steam Winter Sale is kicking off in three weeks' time on 21st of December. Perhaps you're looking forward to picking up something for the holiday season. Rockstar have promised a first look game trailer for GTA 6 in December of this year. Now, being a first look, the game's release could well be another two or three years off yet, but fans of the series will no doubt be excited to get some official news from the developer, and I know I've been keen to get a glimpse at possible locations and characters, if the team are ready to give us that much. There have been rumours and alleged leaks flying around the internet for at least the last couple of years now, and I remember people starting to look forward to the next instalment as far back as 2016, so let's hope this trailer lives up to all the hype and gives us something to really get excited for. And here's something pretty cool. Ubisoft are giving away Assassin's Creed Syndicate for free. All you have to do is log in to your Ubisoft account and claim it. But act fast as this deal's only on offer until 6th of December. So that's just under a week for you to get your hands on this title for free. If you've not played it, AC Syndicate released not long after the launch of the Xbox One and PS4 consoles, if memory serves, and sees you take on the roles of assassin siblings Jacob and Evie Fry in Victorian London. The game also took some steps in the direction of the RPG style we saw later in Origins, Odyssey and Valhalla, but didn't yet give us numbers flying out of opponents' heads as you gave them what for. The game did some other interesting things, including allowing you to zipline between billowing chimney stacks and iconic landmarks like the Houses of Parliament and the Elizabeth Tower. Also, as Jacob, you could engage in underground, meaning illegal, not literally under the ground, bare-knuckle fights to earn more XP. But before I make a segment all about Assassin's Creed Syndicate, The point I'm making is that now's the time for you to go and claim your free copy. So do it now! And while you're at it, I'll set up the main segment of this week's podcast. This week, I'm going to talk about three games which I will announce in just a moment. I've decided to talk on these because they all possess an excellent sense of humour and because the latter two were inspired by the first. Shall we do our stars in their eyes bit again? The first of these games was developed by Bullfrog Productions and published by Electronic Arts in 1997. It's a business simulation game in which you manage a public service, at least if it was UK based you'll have to build different facilities to balance both the books and the bedpans. And if you haven't guessed it yet, why don't I tell you what game I'm talking about? Well, tonight, Matthew, I'm going to be talking about Theme Hospital and the Two Point Games. Do you remember Stars in Their Eyes, by the way? It was a Saturday night television staple in the 90s, along with Gladiators, but S-I-T-E, or Sight, as no one ever called it, was altogether more gentle programming. The highlights that stand out to me were the season winner, who sang Christy Berg's Lady in Red, 
and also comedian Harry Hill performing as Morrissey, singing The Smiths' This Charming Man on the Celebrity Special. And that's probably enough chatter about stars in their eyes, and possibly the last time we do that bit. I don't want to overdo it, after all. But if you really enjoyed it, and want more in future episodes, you must write in and let me know. Theme Hospital. That's what I'm meant to be talking about. I first played this game round a friend's house who had it on PC. We were only nippers at the time, and I remember we were terrified of the doctor in the opening video sequence, who treats his patient with a chainsaw and then discards him down a waste disposal chute. In Theme Hospital, you're put in charge of opening a new hospital, and your first task will be to place a GP's office and a reception desk. The patients will start flooding through your doors, but what's this? There's nowhere for them to sit while they wait to be seen to. Put some benches in for the poor souls. And that patient's been crossing their legs for the last three hours. Don't you think you should build a toilet block? Your staff are getting fatigued. Build them a staff room where they can take a load off for ten minutes. You don't want medical staff making errors after all. Yes, Theme Hospital really makes you oversee all aspects of running a hospital, including taking care of staff remuneration and hiring maintenance staff to look after your machines and extend their useful life. You'll build wards, diagnosis rooms including cardio and treatment rooms, and this is where the game's humour comes into play. It's not really as dry as I made it sound so far. Sure, you'll be treating some ordinary ailments like the common cold and diarrhoea. I apologise if you're eating your dinner while listening to this. That's all I'll say on that matter. I promise. You'll also come across less familiar conditions like TV personalities. These patients walk in dressed up like the king himself. Mr Elvis Presley, that is. Not old sausage fingers. They'll need some time with a psychiatrist to convince them to take the catsuit and wig off and re-enter society as a valuable member. On this note, though, I believe we can afford ourselves a brief diversion here. Have you come across the band Elvana yet, dear listener? Their premise is that the king's not dead, but he has had a nasty bump on the head, and when he came round, believed himself to be the front man for Nirvana. They cover Nirvana songs, and sometimes he remembers to sing in the style of Elvis. He has had a nasty bump on the head, after all. Anyway, they play really well, and they're great fun to watch if you do get to see them live. I've caught them a few times now, and they're brilliant. Perhaps the most memorable condition you'll treat in Theme Hospital... No, it's not heaped piles, although you genuinely will come across cases of that too... ...is Bloaty Head. These patients come in looking like those football big head statuettes you could get back in the 90s. Do you remember them? I'm pretty sure we only had Steve Stone. Oh, and for any listeners in North America, I'm referring to the beautiful game of soccer, for the avoidance of any confusion. To treat bloaty head, you'll need to build an inflator room. The doctor will pop the patient's head like a balloon with a pin. He'll then inflate a new regular-sized head for them. It sounds gory, and it kind of is, as you will briefly see the patient standing there with a gaping hole between their shoulders where their head and neck used to be. Although I did play Theme Hospital on PC at friends' houses, I had the PlayStation port myself. The game effectively plays the same, but I don't know that the PlayStation version had the bonus levels that you could unlock in which you drag your mouse cursor and click to shoot rats as they scurry about the floor. I've never triggered this on PlayStation anyway. I really like Theme Hospital, and I've always liked Theme Hospital since way back when I was still an infant. So when I saw Two Point Hospital release, I was thrilled. Two Point Hospital really is the spiritual successor, and effectively the long-awaited sequel to Theme Hospital. In fact, we waited longer between these games than Rockstar fans have been waiting for GTA 6 to come out. Not to say anything about perhaps exercising a little patience, guys. But no, I get it. GTA 5 was, and indeed still is, a phenomenal game, and I'm just as excited to see the next game in the series as anyone, to be fair. Anyway, Two Point Hospital took a lot of pointers from Theme Hospital, right down to the art style, which is not the same, and all the character models are new, but they have that similar cartoony look to them almost like they were designed by Aardman Studios. 
In Two Point Hospital, you're tasked with opening a new hospital. You'll need to first put in a GP's office and reception desk. The patients will start flooding through the doors. But wait! Haven't we done all this already? Yes, the premise is the same, and a lot of what you'll be doing will have similarities to Theme Hospital as a result. But the developers have honestly made this their own game rather than a simple remaster of a retro classic. Most notably, the illnesses are different. My favourite is probably an almost homage to Bloaty Head. In Two Point County, you'll be treating people with light-headedness. No, they're not just a little bit woozy. These people have literal light bulbs for heads. And the cure? I'm not talking about the gothic band fronted by Robert Smith, although I'm not averse to talking about them. I really like their music and that kind of dark ambience they put into what might have been a light-hearted pop song in someone else's hands. Plus, of course, Robert Smith was called in to save South Park from Mecca Streisand. He's the hero we need, but don't necessarily deserve. Now, where was I? Ah yes, the cure for light-headedness is to unscrew the giant light bulb and replace it with a fresh human head. That's the cure in Two Point Hospital, I should hasten to add. Don't go unscrewing people's heads in real life if they tell you they feel a bit light-headed. You'll get in a lot of trouble for that, and besides, they probably just need something to boost their blood sugar levels, like a Twix or a Mars bar or something. Yes, a Snickers would probably do it, if they're not allergic to peanuts. Yes, I'm sure a Kit Kat would work too. Let's stop calling out the names of chocolate bars, OK? Although, this does bring me back to an important note that I forgot to discuss with you earlier. In Theme Hospital, you can install vending machines in the corridors for your patients who are waiting to be seen. And these are none other than Kit Kat vending machines. So there you go. That snack-based rant I went off on did have a purpose. Like with Theme Hospital, you can build a research department in Two Point as well in order to diagnose and treat new conditions. Theme Hospital also had natural disasters such as earthquakes, and in both games you can choose to treat pandemics. This will trigger a number of patients all suffering the same condition to be brought in en masse to receive treatment by your staff. Succeed, and you could earn yourself a nice little financial bonus that you can put back in to improve the hospital and build new rooms. Two Point Hospital takes the challenge a step further though, in at least two ways that I can think of off the top of my head. The first of which is climate. Some hospitals are built in particularly cold regions, so you'll need to install additional radiators and manage your energy bills to ensure the comfort of staff and patients alike whilst being able to afford salaries and the upkeep of equipment so that you can continue to dispense remedies to the local ailing population. The other new challenge comes in the form of room prestige. Staff are happier in better decorated and better furnished rooms. Happier staff work more effectively, and that in turn makes for happier, safer and healthier patients. But it's not just a case of bunging a potted plant in the GP's office and a second sofa in the staff room. To improve overall prestige for the hospital, you'll also need to kit your corridors out with seating, yes we've covered that, vending machines, posters, statues and other items of aesthetic value. All this will also improve your ratings with inspectors and visitors. And that is the last common theme with, well, with theme hospital that I'd like to address before we look at the third game that I propose we talk about today, being of course Two Point Campus. In theme hospital and Two Point Hospital, you'll receive letters from local health inspectors and VIPs requesting a visit to your medical establishment. They'll take a full tour and fully assess whether your hospital cuts the mustard. If they're impressed, they'll not only tell you so, but will also make a financial donation to help you keep up the good work. If things aren't considered up to scratch though, they'll certainly let you know the areas they feel you could improve in. And some of their comments can end up being quite scathing. Although Two Point Campus shares many similarities with the other games, it is still a two-point game after all. It also breaks out and does its own thing, as this time you're charged with opening and running a university, not a hospital. You'll choose which courses to run and employ lecturers to deliver those courses. 
but this time you're not just dealing with pop-ins. The students are here year-round, so you'll also need to accommodate them. You'll build dormitories, toilets, shower blocks, common rooms, and even a student union bar to which you can invite local celebrities to come and perform. That's right, these young people are paying a lot of money to attend your school, and you'll provide them with a fully rounded experience, laying on the entertainment as well as the academic opportunities. You'll also want to keep an eye on their grades, and if you see anyone falling behind in class, set up some one-to-one -one tuition for them to give them the best shot at making it to graduation possible. Speaking of which, lecturers will set assignments, so do make sure the library is stocked with all relevant reading materials and research stations. You'd hate to be seen to be setting them up for failure, after all. Welfare should be another of your concerns. These young adults might be going through a rough time of things and have a touch of the moody blues. Well, I don't think any knights in white satin are going to fix things for them. And never mind whether they're of legal age of consent, you don't want your university to get that kind of reputation in the press. Instead, you will offer counselling. Allow your students to talk through their problems with a trained professional who can help them to always look on the bright side of life. So what are some of the courses on offer? Shall we peruse the prospectus quickly? Students can study robotics, home economics, scientography, or even attend night school and learn all about chivalry. The most useful course, from your point of view, will likely be archaeology, as you can sell the relics your students dig up in order to improve your cash flows. Finally, let's talk extracurricular activities. Your students can join clubs and societies for like-minded people who enjoy naps, a good book, or cross-country running. Each club will ask for different items, like a giant hamster wheel for the running club, or bushes that the naturist naturalists can practice some naked topiary on. Be careful with those secateurs, won't you? I love all the games that I've talked about today, but if you had to pin me down on a favourite, hmm, it's tough. Theme Hospital really kicked things off and gave us not only a fantastic game in its own right, but also laid the way for the other two. Two Point Hospital resurrected the original game, gave it a nice new lick of paint, and threw in some new mechanics for good measure. But I think Two Point Campus might just edge it for me, as it took a new direction of its own, while still reminding us of everything we loved from Theme Hospital. And that, my friends, is another episode in the can, as they say. I hope you've enjoyed listening to this episode of Off The Rails as much as I've enjoyed recording it. If you have, feel free to share it around. And remember, offrailgamer at gmail.com is the best place to write me if you'd like your comment read out in a future listener's whispers. Just keep it clean and don't be mean. Well, goodbye then.